All right. Just a little theory geeking. Not too much, but just a taste. Um, um, a couple of people had to go in there, so when we do our, our last little bit, um, I have one more appreciation in mind for us to do. Um, and so you may have to find a different partner for this one because some people, you know, had to, had to go. Um, just to, you know, see if we can unpack the kind of components of this because, I mean, the world is chock-a-block full of um, uh, potent experiences. I mean, there's just like lots and lots of places to go and ways to get like really uh, potent experiences. Um, you know, what we're, and, and really, you know, like if you want to look for some of the most potent experiences, you know, available in applied psychology, um, you know, where you would tend, where, well, where I would probably go look would be, you know, in existential psychology and in, uh, Gestalt psychology and places like that for um, you know really potent kinds of experiences that um, uh, people have had. You know my concern with those areas is that none of those areas has ever developed a robust um, science tradition, and so kind of what you're left with is something that looks a little bit like magic or something. And it's sort of like I went and something happened and, you know, wow, you know. Um, I'm, I'm just not satisfied with that. I mean, um, I had a lot of those experiences, you know, back in the, back in the day. <laughs> You know, what I'm interested in is can we have a science of those things? Um, and, you know, there are a lot of people, you know, in those areas who uh, uh, turned their back on science. You know, they basically said, you know, in existential psychology and humanistic psychology and, you know, gestalt, um, you know, just, you know, there's a certain, I mean, you can get guys like, Irvin Yalom, and I have tremendous respect for Yalom's work and think he's, you know, brilliant. And I got, you know, existential psychology on my bookshelf, and I've got, you know, Yalom's group therapy book on my bookshelf. And, you know, I, I think that's like really great stuff, but you can catch Irvin Yalom saying basically things like, science can't go where we want to travel. Um, you know, science can't speak about the things that. Um, we want to speak about. And I, you know, maybe Yalom's right, um, but if we bet on Yalom, he, he's definitely right. Um, so I'm just betting Yalom's wrong about that. You know, I mean, he's a smart guy. I don't think I'm smarter than Yalom. I'm just making a different bet than Yalom. And my bet is, you know, that we can have a science of human liberation. You know, that's, that's my bet. And this is like, you know, a little... Um, a little slice of, of that uh, attempt at that science. And so we don't want to just know about powerful experiences. We want to know about um, processes that we can investigate um, scientifically so that we can learn if the things that are obviously connected to powerful experience are actually connected to powerful experience. Because, you know, just because things are obvious does not mean that those things are therefore true. Um, you know, like, like the, uh, here's something obvious. The earth is flat. You know, like I've presented workshops and I think I figured out uh, before I left on this trip, 23 countries. And every single one of them I've been to has been flat. You know, I climbed off the airplane, I looked around and it was flat, you know. And so I wonder, where is this whole round thing, these scientists with their so-called facts are talking about, you know. See, if everything that was obvious was true, we wouldn't need science. I mean, it would be unnecessary. Um, but it turns out that sometimes really obvious things are, are just false or, um, 
in a kind of contextual way of thinking of it, and that's, of course, what I mean by false, not useful. They're just not useful ways of speaking. And so, you know, what we want is a way to unpack um, the conditions necessary to precipitate potent experiences in people that can uh, be examined using scientific methods. So there are lots of ways of speaking about these experiences. I wouldn't take anything away from uh, any of them. They don't have to be scientific ways of speaking. Shakespeare knew how to talk about this, right? He's, the guy's lying on his deathbed, you know? He's dying, his lover um, looks down into his eyes, you know, and he looks up into hers and he sees in her eyes uh, his own passing and he sees the sadness in her eyes. And he says to her, that time of year thou mayst in me behold when yellow leaves or none or few do shake against the cold. Bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. See, that's a way to talk about, you know, appreciation. You know, the appreciation of, of, of sadness and love and of loss. And it's a perfectly good and wonderful and marvelous way to talk about it. But it is not a way to talk about it that lends itself to scientific investigation. I, that's okay. I mean... I, I quoted Shakespeare in my dissertation defense, you know, to defend other ways of speaking as valid and important ways of speaking. So I'm going to speak about this not the way it is, but in a way that I hope lends itself to a scientific uh, analysis and investigation and, and especially to experimentation. What's inside of that exercise from an ACT perspective? you know, from a psychological flexibility perspective. Well, lots of kind of contact with the present moment. You know, one of the things that we're investigating, and I think one of the things that um, you can use, and I talk at great lengths in Mindfulness for Two. By the way, go buy the last copies of Mindfulness for Two so Jen Plum doesn't have to bring them home in her luggage. She would probably really rather go shopping and bring some, like, new dresses home or something. I go to incredible lengths in Mindfulness for Two talking about how to um, sort of lift up present moment processes. And the, one of the ways that you can lift up present moment processes, um, and by that, you know, we're interested in this kind of flexible, focused, non-exclusive attention, and, you know, this kind of on-purpose movement of attention, um, is in the details. And so, you know, what I coached you to do in the exercise and in the writing was to, like, let yourself drop down into the details and allowing your awareness to sort of shift from this detail to that detail. And what happens when you do that is the other details of the experience start to kind of rise up, you know, things like tastes or, or tactile kinds of sensations. You know, the minute you sort of, you know, if you would have told me, yeah, my mom used to dry me off. It was really terrific and, you know, it was nice. You know, that would not bring you into that. But when you start to sink into some of the details, you start to notice the others and you get this quality of engagement. Now, one of the things that we want to do, you know, to facilitate the cultivation of a kind of uh, practiced awareness like this is to let people sort of touch those details and then... You can notice places in the exercise where I ask you to let go of those and come back to your own breath, right? And then, you know, maybe to the face of the individual you're appreciating. And so what I'm asking you to do there is to sort of practice this kind of gentle, non-exclusive, sort of flexible, focused uh, attention, right? As a practice. That's part of that um, exercise. Um, and it's also part, uh, uh, in the front end of it, it's also very much, I think, a part of the exercise, um, you know, where you have this kind of exchange, um, you know, to allow yourself to bring yourself to each detail of the experience um, and, and maybe not to get sort of lodged on one, but to sort of move with flexibility from 
you know, one sort of instance and detail and, and feature uh, to the next, the same way you'd sort of, you know, look across a picture or something, yeah. To just look at the mindfulness processes in particular, um, you know, acceptance doesn't look like way lifted up in this, but um, let me just ask you a question. Uh, when I first started doing uh, things like the sweet spot exercise, I used to do the sweet spot and the sad spot, and pretty quickly I figured out that you really didn't have to do that, that if you did the sweet spot, that, you know, all these kind of... So if in, you know, the appreciation of someone who has been meaningful and important to you, which is, you know, presumably a pretty sweet thing, did you notice any sadness showing up in the midst of that? Just lift your hand up if you notice sadness, you know, maybe showing up in the midst of that. It's really common, uh, you know, it's a very common thing, you know, that, you know, to find values and vulnerabilities poured from the same, um, from the same vessel. Um, and so although acceptance is, you know, not like so really highlighted in that kind of an, and that particular variation of an exercise, you can find places to practice it in there. Um, you know, if you've got a really busy mind, maybe there's a chance to practice acceptance of the fact that, um, you know, staying with a mindfulness exercise for more than a single breath or a breath and a half is challenging. It certainly is for me. Uh, the diffusion piece in this, um, you know, and really the purpose of cultivating these um, appreciations, I think, rose up inside my own work group and kind of noticing how easy it is to get caught in life where you're kind of putting out the fire that's in your hair, you know, and there's this chapter that needs to be done and this, you know, you know, ever expanding checklist of, you know, things that need to be done in life and how easy it is to kind of get caught up in this storied up version about what is going to be required for me to successfully inhabit the planet, you know, over the course of the next, you know, day, week, month, year. And, and you know, things like these really uh, meaningful relationships and connections we have in our life um, get missed, right? And so the exercise contains this kind of intentional act where you know, I'm asking you to kind of drop out of the problem-solving world for just a moment, you know, to just take a little rest from that, you know, world of, you know, this kind of storied-up version of the problems you need to solve, you know, in order to, like, get along in your own life. And even a little bit of coaching in there about letting go of kind of, you know, getting it right or picking the right person to appreciate or, you know, writing in whole sentences and paragraphs and things like that. You know, there's just like a little invitation in there to see if you can let go of that. Now, probably people in the room can look at, you know, you know a kind of a more or less kind of continuum of how easy that was to, you know, to accomplish. Um, you know, you all have done a lot of writing, so it's kind of uh, hard to let go maybe of that kind of critical eye of what writing is supposed to look like um, in the midst of that. And maybe, you know, that sort of rose up in there. Um, in that regard, it is a place to practice uh, diffusion, you know, to notice that this isn't a place um, where those rules are needed, you know, where those rules are useful and to just sort of gently let go of them. Um, we're going to be doing another appreciation, and, um, you know, I want to invite you to sort of notice these places where problem-solving mode of mind sort of ramps up and to use those as opportunities um, to practice letting go of those and then to notice what rises up, you know, in those interstices, you know, those uh, margins where we let go of problem-solving uh, even briefly. It's remarkable how little it takes. Um, in the self-domain, there's a kind of a perspective-taking piece that um, inhabits the exercise in considerable degree. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of like sort of seeing others in your life and seeing your interactions with them and maybe seeing them currently, 
and historically. And so, you know, there was a lot of kind of temporal perspective taking that was coached in there. There's another piece of perspective taking, and that is when you are engaged in this um, interaction with another person and they're sharing this appreciation with you, there's an opportunity in there to sort of let go of kind of problem solving and understanding and like that and to like let yourself in some ways kind of inhabit their perspective to sort of see from their eyes, uh, to hear from their ears. And, and you know, if you can sort of uh, allow that, you know, um, uh, make a place within yourself for that, you know, sometimes things show up, you know, like the potency of the experience sort of shows up um, in, in that exchange. My suspicion is that, you know, Linda had some sense of the potency of that that showed up, you know, as it was showing up for you. I mean, this is a very potent kind of, a, you know, that, you know, yeek, RFT kind of IU kind of perspective taking uh, sort of thing. Like it's really hard to, it's much harder to turn you into an object and to treat you like I can treat objects, you know, when I have a sense of what it's like to look from your eyes, you know, to hear, you know, from your ears to feel with your heart. Right? We really need to turn people into objects and, 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 and in fact, Another piece of perspective taking that is, you know, in there is sometimes when people tell their own story and they tell it at a pace where they're capable of showing up uh, to it, they stop treating themselves as objects too. You know, because we love to do that, you know, sort of that dance between turning ourselves into some good object or some bad object. There's a values piece in this exercise too, you know, and the values piece has to do with both the content of the exercise, you know, and you know what it means to be a son and to appreciate a mother, um, but there's also, you know, the other one like people are not in this room by accident. Did anybody get here by accident? See, if you got here by accident, you figured that out by like about Wednesday afternoon, and you just decided Rome would be a much more interesting place to be. There's no way you're in a workshop, certainly not my workshop on Friday afternoon by accident. <laughs> There's something that you care about that has to do with, you know, exchanges between human beings that are like, you know, genuine and, and, and uh, engaged and real and um, um, uh, meaningful. And, you know, that is a piece of that exercise that you had a chance to practice in there. Um, and, and, and there's the sort of all the going away that happens and the, you know, returning you know, to the person you're in the exercise with. Committed action, uh, at least my favorite way to talk about committed action, um, you know, whereas values are sort of patterns of act, action, sort of, you know, what does it mean for me to be a fellow human with you? What does it mean for me to be someone who's interested in furthering my training so that I can be useful, you know, more useful to the people I serve? There's a pattern of activity in there. Commitment is really, you know, the particular moment when I notice that I'm off that pattern and I return to it. So, I, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, oh man, Fabian's got a much better appreciation than mine. I should have picked something else. I should have gone to a different workshop. You know, in the meantime, Fabian's like waiting for me to show up, you know. And I have this chance, like when I notice that like I'm not there, and he's talking about something meaningful and important to like return to him, right? Commitment processes. So there's opportunities to practice all these processes uh, in this exercise. Now we're gonna do, I, I think we're good for, I mean, let's, we can take a couple of minutes. I have one more appreciation that I would like us to kind of dip down into. Um, but um, if there are like questions or comments or or anything rising up out of that exercise or um, out of this, you know, kind of little dance around um, psychological flexibility, uh, the psychological flexibility model, I'd 
be happy to entertain them. Yeah. Okay. Um, when, um, when I was thinking about my friend and um, she's a person who has quite a few health problems of late, so she's a lot more fragile than I want her to be. <laughs> um, and I often don't notice it. Like, it's something that I don't want to be there, so I kind of push it away. And I was thinking, when I was sort of reflecting on this bit of time that we'd spent together, and I could kind of see the fragility in her face without having to block it or ignore it or try and solve it or, you know. It, so a lot of acceptance stuff came up for me of just letting my friend have that. Yeah, well, I mean, it's lovely. It's, I mean... I mean, then this is like what we do. We see something, and it's especially probably disconcerting because this is somebody you care about. So you don't want them to be uh, vulnerable. So you know, what do you do about it? Except, you know, I mean, hell, it's not like we're really great at solving our own vulnerabilities. You know, in workshops, I talk to people about the kind of things they carry from the time they're like little kids, you know. And, you know, what we do is we either sort of scramble to problem solve it or just like you said, we, you know, kind of pretend like it's not there. And, and I don't mean that we need to be responsive to, like, everything that happens and everybody all the time. Um, but you would want, I would want to be able to be available, you know, as a choice and to be unavailable as a choice. You know, I don't think there's any demonizing unavailability. There are people in my own life that, you know, I choose when I'm available to them. And, and that's a good plan, you know, for me. And uh, so I don't mean to demonize unavailability, um, but I can also think of, um, you know, times like the last time I saw my brother Randy alive when, um, you know, I was wholly unavailable and there was nothing of choice uh, or awareness in that unavailability. So it's a gift, you know, to notice that and, and to hear, you know, you make contact with that. Others? Questions? Comments? Yeah, Martin. I just want to check if that's something that's more or less idiosyncratic or more general. Okay. Um, the people or the places that I really appreciate somehow seems, seem to me either people who inspire values in me or awaken them. Something. So there's... Is that a general thing you find, or is that a weird thing of mine? <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, I guess I've never, I never really thought of it that way, but I suppose it'd be kind of hard to imagine. I, I, I guess I've never heard anybody talk about an appreciation that wasn't connected to some value or another, you know, either uh, interpersonal values or kind of aesthetic, you know, sorts of, you know, sunsets and music and you know, really outstanding coffee, <laughs> for example. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think there's, uh, you know, it seems like there's something kind of intrinsically kind of connected there. Others, questions, concerns, observations, arisings of any sort, objections. No, no, not that at all. All right, let's, uh, we're going to dip down into um, one more uh, appreciation. And Mo, do you have um, hand sitting there? So, you know, Usually when we think about appreciation, we think about like appreciating um, like good stuff, you know, Christmas and mom and, uh, you know, uh, the feel of a lover holding you or, you know, things like that. Um, uh, but I'm interested in these, this exact same set of processes in um, uh, more difficult um, places. And so maybe like in places where, you know, you usually don't think of them, 
in terms of appreciation. Um, and so, uh, you know, I mean, I've been, uh, did, did people see um, Marsha uh, Linehan's uh, thing like in the New York Times just like last uh, week or two? If you didn't see it, you just, just go, you know, Google New York Times Marsha Linehan. And uh, I'm like uh, so, I mean, I just can't like sort of gather all the words like um, uh, proud uh, to be you know, part of that same tradition that um, Marsha lives inside of. And, um, you know, just like as a fellow human. Um, but I'm also like really, really grateful to Marsha because, you know, I've been going around the world talking about um, my own sort of, mm, shall we say, colorful history um, in pretty open ways for like a long time. And I'm uh, working on a substance abuse book right now that has is, is probably the first time that I like really wrote explicitly in a publication. And I did have pause to sort of think like what they would think about that in my department, you know? And just sort of like, you know, maybe, uh, you know, oh my God, somebody like that is working here. Um, uh, and uh, maybe a segment of like, well, even if it's true, you shouldn't say it, you know? and. Uh, and uh, Marsha just licensed me in a big way, you know. <laughs> and I just have to say, you know, like, thank you. <laughs> you know, thank you. Because uh, if it's okay for Marsha to talk out loud, then it's okay for me to talk out loud. Um, it was very cool what she said, you know, and, Mar and for the folks who didn't see it, um, Marsha... <laughs> Marsha talked about um, a psychiatric hospitalization in like 1961 that lasted for like I think almost two years and um, and it was not like a casual psychiatric hospitalization. You know, it was like the padded room psychiatric hospitalization and about a decade of, you know, a, this kind of heroic struggle to stay alive you know, to stay in this world. And, um, and she said, uh, in this one place I was uh, reading about this, she said uh, something about, um, I just couldn't die a coward. Like I owed it to the people that I've worked with, you know, and to people in the world to just say this out loud, you know, to talk about it. And uh, well, I've always had tremendous respect for Marshall Linehan, but and uh, I guess it would be hard for it to like get higher, but it got higher that day. So this is um, this is a little appreciation um, from Facebook. Um, something that you know doesn't really sort of sound like a you know like a really good thing or anything. So, you know what this appreciation is about is about. Um, a period of time um, when I, uh, in 1985 when I uh, let go of um, 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 getting high like every day, which I had been doing for, you know, the 15 years pr prior to that. You know, like I had a couple of days not getting high during that 15 years. Um, and those were like all days when I was like incarcerated for something or other. Um, and the minute I got out of uh, jail, you know, the very first thing I attended to was like getting high. And so after like 15 years of that, like every day, this was like this period of time of um, letting go of that and trying to like find a way to live in this world just exactly the way it is, um, unmedicated. And um, my skin did not fit, you know, in a like really profound way. Like, um, it was really apparent to me that I was incapable of inhabiting this planet, you know. And um, some days, I mean, now some days I did pretty good, you know. Um, but some days, the very best I could do was just like sit on my hands, you know, just really, literally just sit on my hands. And so, um, I wrote this in response to um, some people that were kind of like really very much in that 
um, space. And it's, it's an appreciation. Even slower than baby steps, the best I can do some days is to sit on my hands. If I'm sitting on my hands, it is very hard to make much of a mess to clean up later. Let's say I started down this road something like 24 years ago. There was a time in the winter of 1985 when I would be up in the night lying on the bathroom floor, heart sick, the house quiet all around me, alone, lying on that floor between bouts of retching. I could feel the cool of the linoleum on my cheek, and it was good. There in that bathroom, in the middle of the night, tortured, I found a moment of rest. My cheek pressed to the cool floor. My whole world was reduced to six square inches of cool linoleum. I could not leave that room without the terrors welling up around me. Even trying to rise from the floor filled me with awareness of all that I had done and regretted and all that I had not done and regretted more. It was a starting point. People taught me about acceptance and by inches I made my way up off the bathroom floor and out of that bathroom. When I look where acceptance has taken me over the years, I have to pinch myself. I have fallen in love with people all over the world, like you. I have become intimate with people and places and ideas that I could not have imagined. I have found souls all along the way who saw possibilities in me that I could not see in myself. And I have, in turn, had the privilege of seeing in others, like you, Mo, strength and beauty and possibility that they could not see. And, and I can count a lot of days, a lot, between that barren winter of 1985 and this day, this morning, this moment, a lot of days when the best I could do was sit on my hands. And today, I count those days sitting on my hands as good days. All in a row, they brought me right here together with you. Welcome. Rest a while. There will be time. Perhaps we can sit together on our hands today. And tomorrow, there won't be much mess to clean up. And we will rise together and sweep up and go about our day as best we are able. So if today is a day of hand sitting, Think of it as practice. The day will surely come when someone in need calls out. We are not likely to be able to reach out and reverse time in their world, bring parents back from the dead, retrieve a lost opportunity, a lost love, any more than we can turn back the clock in our own world. But perhaps, if we have practiced, we can sit with them on our hands if it's that kind of day, but together, and perhaps we will find a way in this world, just as it is, to fall in love and to see beauty and strength and possibility together. And so, this next appreciation, um, I'm gonna invite you in a little sit um, to look at hard places in your own life. Um, and to notice that no matter how hard those uh, places are that you have sat, that um, you know whatever you did brought you here. You know, and to see if you can look into you know some hard place in your own life and appreciate. maybe what was lost there, but also um, what you can carry away from it and what you might be able to carry from that experience into your life, you know, today and into your exchanges and interactions with the people around you. You with me? Hear me? And if you're just like stumped, 
welcome. You know, welcome. Um, I'll invite you to just like sit inside of being stumped and, and uh, let that be the way it is. So are you ready for a little sit and a little write and a little share? Yeah. Or maybe you got to catch a fast train to Milan. I need a drink about now. So let me invite you to settle into your place. And perhaps a little more briefly, we're just going to sort of follow that same pattern that we followed in the previous appreciation. So let me invite you to allow your eyes to go gently closed and allow yourself to perhaps become a witness to the gentle inflow and outflow of your own breath. And maybe you can uh, notice that that breath that is sustaining you now um, has been doing that job for a very long time. Sometimes a long time without any notice at all. And maybe you can take this moment to appreciate your own breath and its gift of sustenance. Each time your mind wanders, let me invite you to allow your own breath to call you back home to this moment. Let this small piece of work together be something that you don't have to figure out in advance. Perhaps you can allow yourself to come to stillness, to offer yourself the gift of stillness in this moment. Just gently letting your awareness come to rest on the rise and fall of breath. And now I'd like to invite you to um, bring to mind some loss in your own life. Perhaps a lost uh, friend or opportunity or someone you cared about. To just allow yourself to let your awareness move gently around your own life and see if you can notice the hard places. And if you find yourself saying no to that, see if it's possible to just breathe even those ins, nose in and out 
like air. What if you don't even have to fight the nose? Just gently allow your awareness to travel back through time and to touch the hard places you've known in your own life. And if you find yourself sort of locking onto one, see if you can hold it a little more gently. Just let your awareness touch down, perhaps in particular moments that offered you an awareness of that loss. And maybe you could be a witness to your own face in those moments. Maybe you could look in to your own face, into your own eyes, and see that sense of loss. And if you notice yourself wanting to turn away, Let me invite you to just hold that lightly and um, maybe you can uh, recognize some sense of loss, of loneliness, of sadness in that face you wore on that day. Maybe you could imagine that you could bend down gently and uh, kiss the forehead of you in that moment. Maybe you could look into those eyes and say, I know. Just simply that. See if you can just let go of any resistance just for a moment and allow yourself to be a witness to sort of notice the details that inhabit that loss. Maybe you can notice how easy it is to turn away and let me invite you to just allow it to be there. Not all paintings are pretty. Rodin knew about that. Just let yourself Notice the moments leading up to that. Notice the things flowing from it. Maybe you could let yourself notice what it is that you did in response. Did you draw back? Did you hide? Did you fight? And if so, maybe you could just, as an act of kindness, uh, be a witness to that, letting go for just a moment of any judgment. And if you find that you're not breathing, you might consider allowing your breath to fill you. Allow
allowing yourself to breathe in and out the witnessing of this experience in your life. Now, in a moment, I'm going to invite you to write. And when I do, I want to invite you to write just a few details that connect to this sense of loss, kind of what that was about. And the other thing I want to invite you to a question I'd like you to, to invite you to inhabit is a question that if something valuable could grow up out of that loss, you know, something that you would count as a treasure could grow out of that loss, what might that be if there was some act of kindness, some pattern of living that could emerge from that loss for you that would dignify that loss, that would honor that loss, I want to invite you to just wonder what that might be. Sometimes um, new things grow from things that have fallen. And so when you're ready, please allow your eyes to come open gently and let yourself write a bit about this loss and a bit about if something could grow from that loss, what that might be. Maybe what it would mean to you if, if you were the steward of, of that, the steward of something growing from that loss. If you were the sort of gardener who grew something new on the ground of that loss. Uh, good, rich earth comes from um, 
uh, things that have fallen. So if the good, rich earth of your own losses was a place something could grow, what would you grow there? We only have uh, just a little more time here together. And so I'm going to invite you to allow this to be the start of something that you write, not the finish of it. And I'm going to invite you to just let go of the writing part of this task right now. And I want you to just settle in for just a second. I want to invite you to settle in for just a second and to maybe let yourself notice that things grow from things fallen. And, you know, if you could be the gardener kind of of your own life and grow something, you know, where things have fallen that um, honored those losses. And, you know, I just wonder if you would wonder with me, you know, what you would grow there. And if that seems impossible to you, then I would invite you to imagine a world where it is possible. And if you think you're not up to the task, I would like you to imagine a world where you are up to the task. Sometimes things that are obvious are just not so. So what if it is so that you could grow something new on that ground, that very ground? And I want to invite you in just these next couple of minutes, um, if you choose, um, to speak um, with your partner um, about what it is that you would hope to grow um, on the ground where that uh, loss occurred, okay? And it can be small and simple. And if it is not your day to speak, then, you know, we're absolutely going to, like, honor, um, you know, your silence here today. Like, you know, this is um, for you and for the life you want to grow. This is not for me. Um, but I want to invite it and invite people um, uh, to hear um, what people would like to grow in the law, you know, on the ground of the losses in their own lives. So if you would, um, I invite you to take a moment or two and to share quietly. We will not, I will not like ring the bell in between. So just 
take a few moments and um, if there's something to be said, um, allow yourself to say it. And let me invite you to see if you can, you know, let yourself show up to the quality that you brought to that last appreciation, you know, and allow yourself to appreciate what you would grow there if you could and allow your partner to like hear what it is that you would grow there, you know, in a world where that was possible. So when you're ready, pick a partner. Had we but world enough and time, there's probably uh, people are probably like not finished. And uh, you know, if we were to talk about all the kinds of things that we hoped would grow out of the losses in our lives, uh, um, there would probably be no finish to that uh, conversation. Um, the reason I invite you into this appreciation is. Um, I think that it touches really directly on, you know, what it is we're asking um, of our clients. Um, because, you know, we, we're always looking for that sort of um, good, clear ground to grow something on, you know. Um, but where is that? <laughs> you know, and the clients certainly who come into our office, you know, if they're looking for that, like, place where you know, none of the losses are to grow a life, you know, there's no life to be grown. And, um, you know, I guess um, for all of us uh, here, um, it is my hope, you know, it's not really like the answers to that question, what would you grow um, on this ground as it is the sort of willingness to inhabit the question you know, to sit with your own losses in your own life and inhabit a question about, you know, what you might grow there that would honor those losses. And um, it is my sense that um, if we can, you know, practice, you know, in these ways, um, kind of presence, acceptance, you know, holding lightly the stories about how those losses get to decide what we get to have, be, and do in our lives, um, you know, that we can um, take perspective on those and look back on them and look ahead at what they might uh, deliver and to uh, inhabit questions about the patterns that we would hope to grow in our own lives um, and to look for places where we're turned away from those um, where we could return that, you know, our own lives can be improved and that we can be in a better position to um, help the people who are um, uh, coming to us in need uh, to, to grow the lives that uh, they could love. Um, you know, not on some other ground, but on the, you know, very ground they stand, on the very losses that they bring to us. We have, uh, we have uh, used up our time. Um, it is my hope that we have used it well. Um, you know, as somebody who um, spent a a lot of days um, where the best he could do uh, was uh, to sit on his hands and as somebody who um, spent the first 30 years of his life um, completely and utterly certain that um, uh, he could not be useful 
Um, I hope that we've done some things here that are useful to you in your own lives and useful to you in the work that um, you've chosen. And um, I want to express my most profound gratitude um, uh, to you for giving uh, me the chance uh, to be uh, useful here today. So um, I hope to see you uh, down the road. And uh, in the meantime, uh, like we say in Oxford, Mississippi, namaste, y'all. <laughs> Just giving her a little chance to practice acceptance. <laughs>